Christmas Eve, 1947. As Americans celebrated another year of peace, a new invention, later named the transistor, was being demonstrated at Bell Laboratories by physicists Walter Bratton, William Shockley, and John Bardeen. The information age was beginning. With the advent of the transistor, the world would soon witness the start of the computer revolution and the creation of new consumer products. An early 1950s film foretold the transistor's coming wonders. You may be able to get music with a flick of your wrist from the so-called Dick Tracy radio. And with a portable television set, you may be able to enjoy video entertainment anywhere you go. The seeds of these modern marvels were planted long before 1947. At Bell Laboratories in the 1930s, scientists and engineers were working to satisfy the country's communication needs. In those days, telephone systems used electromagnetic relays to switch calls, and vacuum tubes were employed to amplify signals. But the vacuum tube was fragile, expensive, wasted power, and had an unpredictable lifetime. Development led to smaller, more efficient models, but vacuum tube capabilities were reaching their limits. The quest for a more reliable, long-lived amplifier began. Scientists at Bell Labs decided to concentrate this search on unusual solid materials called semiconductors. In 1972, along with colleagues Bardeen and Shockley, Walter Bratton recalled the early research. In 1935, working in semiconductors, and I realized the possibility and the importance of a solid-state active device or amplifier. And the motivation for the work that I was doing was trying to understand what was going on in semiconductors, especially at the surface between a semiconductor and a metal or between two semiconductors. Scientists in many disciplines were studying the properties and behavior of semiconductors. Their intriguing properties suggested promise for finding a viable amplifying device to Bell Labs physicist William Shockley. This uh, led me to see if one could not find other ways of accomplishing the same sort of things that vacuum tubes accomplished. And I went through a series of trials of this sort uh, prior to World War II. And in fact, Walter Bratton and I worked together trying to make a version of a transistor in late 1939 or early 1940. As recorded in the team's laboratory notes, these early experiments failed. But they provided data and theories that proved critical to future progress after the end of World War II. By 1946, Bell Labs was committed to a major effort to create a working solid-state amplifier. A larger group of researchers from many disciplines was assembled to study semiconductors, including the newly recruited theoretician John Bardeen. The team concentrated on semiconductors with the simplest crystal structures, namely silicon and germanium. In an early film on semiconductors, Walter Bratton explained. We have shown here a two-dimensional representation of the germanium lattice. Germanium has four electrons, four valence electrons. It shares one of these valence electrons with each of its four neighbors. When arsenic as an impurity occurs in the germanium crystal, it goes in substitutionally in the place of a germanium atom. The difference, however, here is that the arsenic has five valence electrons, and it only needs four valence electrons to make up these chemical bonds. Therefore, we have one electron left over that's free to wander around the crystal and conduct electricity. And this, as was first called, would be an excess semiconductor. There would be excess electrons left over from the chemical bonding structure. To get the other type, we go back to our periodic table and pick out a impurity from the third column of the periodic table, gallium. Putting this gallium in instead of the arsenic, we then have a situation 
where we only have three valence electrons to fill the bonding structure of the crystal. In other words, we have a vacant position in the bonding structure or hole and that this vacant position can move around. So here we have what has been called a defect semiconductor. In 1947, the team placed these two types of germanium, now known as P-type and N-type, for their positive and negative charge carriers together in an electrical circuit. Electric current from a battery was fed in one direction through a fine wire contact to the germanium. A second point contact wire made a circuit through the germanium in the reverse direction. With this device, the scientists found that current flow could be altered in the germanium. The next step was to control the current flow. Bratton reduced the distance between the contacts by slicing through a gold foil glued to the surface of a plastic wedge. As before, current flow was piped in one direction through a contact, and the second contact again carried current in the reverse direction. But now a small audio signal was applied to the first contact. They found the circuit was amplifying, a phenomena that would soon become known as the transistor effect. Walter Bratton recalls. My notes for the day say this. Using the germanium surface, and the gold contacts, the following circuit was set up. This circuit was actually spoken over, and by switching the device in and out, a distinct gain in speech level could be heard and seen on the scope presentation with no noticeable change in quality. It was determined that the power gain was of the order of a factor of 18 or greater. Just days later, on December 24, 1947, the team demonstrated that the device could oscillate, unambiguous proof of significant power gain. The long research effort had achieved its goal, and the transistor could now be developed for practical applications. Information about the use and potential of the transistor was made a public affair. This is how my voice would sound over a 75-mile telephone line that has no amplifying device. Now, with a transistor amplifier in the line, my voice is amplified so that you can hear me distinctly. This open exchange of information accelerated the growth of the new solid-state industry. The next challenge was to develop a transistor that was reliable, met rigorous performance standards, and that could be produced economically. Intensive development began within AT&T and many outside companies. Shockley's original idea for a junction transistor and new methods for preparing semiconductors were soon developed. Five years after the discovery, commercial transistors were being used as amplifiers, detectors, and switches in a variety of electronic systems. The first transistorized digital computer, Tradic, was developed by Bell Labs for the Air Force, and soon other companies followed the lead. Over the next several years, transistors became so reliable that they were an integral part of AT&T's Telstar, the world's first communication satellite. Since the early 1960s, solid-state technology has grown explosively. With the invention of the integrated circuit, scientists first placed hundreds, then thousands, and eventually millions of devices on a tiny microchip. In recognition of their pioneering efforts, Shockley, Bratton, and Bardeen received the Nobel Prize in 1956. But important strides continue to this day. One new Bell Labs invention allows transistors to be produced atomic layer by atomic layer. Alfred Cho explains. Molecular beam epitaxy is like spray painting a surface with atoms and molecules. We are actually uh, putting down atoms one atom at a time on a surface of a base which we call crisp, uh, substrate to grow single crystal thin films. This is actually done in the other end of this system that uh, we have many small effusion cells or ovens which is filled with gallium, aluminum, and arsenic. And then these effusion cells produce the beams of atoms and molecules impinging on this base material we call substrate to produce thin film materials. Here at AT&T Bell Laboratories, we use this NBE uh, system to grow sandwich structures of gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide, 
for the fabrication of very high speed transistors. Now, ordinary transistors may be only operating at a few uh, million operations per second. Here, with this high speed transistor, we can operate over 100 billion operations per second. The transistor made possible the information age, the age of high-speed computers, data networking, far-reaching voice and video communications, the exploration of outer space, and witnessing it on Earth. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Born of an intense research mission and coordinated teamwork, the transistor continues to shape our modern world.